Are you ready? See you, Brad. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. This is Fireside Chat, episode 55, Off to a Rocky Start, recorded October 13th, 2014. Happy Thanksgiving. This is our Thanksgiving episode of Fireside Chat, and as usual, it's Dan and Matt. Matt, are you full of turkey yet? Not quite yet. No? Haven't haven't done your dinner yet? No. That'll come after. What a better way to spend Thanksgiving weekend than to talk Flames hockey. Um, season started. We're into the regular season now. This team's 1-2 and two so far, which is about where I would have expected them to start. What about you? Yeah, they pretty much met my expectations in terms of the results, so I can't argue with you there. Of all the games to win, I'm so glad they won the Edmonton game. Yeah, well, Edmonton's You don't want to start special. the year losing to the Oilers. True. Edmonton's special, though. <laughs> oh, they sure are. Uh. Um, some of the players that we've noticed so far and how they're looking, um, I think in the Edmonton game, it really brought anyone that hadn't already. It brought Mason Raymond to mind. Um, he got a hat trick there. What would you think of Raymond in that game and how he played? Very solid effort. Uh, he didn't really show a huge amount like of dynamic ability. He just finished three times. And overall his game was solid. He kind of reminds me a bit of Glenn Cross in that like even when he's doing good, it's he's not gonna be like a Jerome Ginla where he blows the socks off. Yeah, he just does his thing and the you know, in that case the results were positive. And I think guys like that, you know, in order to get the really dynamic play from them, need line mates that can help them with that too, which as of right now and as of this roster, I would say Mason Raymond doesn't have. Yeah, that's very much true. Maybe in a couple of years we could get him somebody, but I think he's a solid scorer, but he's not going to be the prettiest guy out there without some great line mates. Yeah, and if he can produce in the same manner that Glenn Cross has over the past few years, then that's a good thing. So I don't see that him being a problem at all. The first Flames goal of the season uh, was in the Vancouver game, four minutes and eight seconds on the clock in period two with Paul Byron scoring, assisted by Joel Colborn. I was surprised that Byron was the first guy to get a goal in the uh, in this season for the Flames, but I thought it was a nice goal. I thought that it really, I thought it was a nice goal by Byron. It showed him good positioning and good ability at the NHL level. Um, I think getting that first goal right away is going to help him stick around for a bit. Yeah, I agree. And I like that he used Goudreau as a distraction for Miller because he kind of froze him there because he was expecting Byron to pass over and was able to right. snap one right through. Yeah. Of the three games so far, I actually think that Byron has been one of the most consistent flames on the ice. I can agree with that. I think he's uh, shown... That he can play at the NHL level, he's you know not looking like an NHL call-up guy, which he has been for the Flames so far. He's looking like the Paul Byron we saw at the end of last year. And I hope that this consistency can keep up, because if it does, I think he's going to be a, a really good player to have on the team this year. He definitely plays like a wrecking ball out there, and he doesn't look like a five foot six forward, no. or doesn't play like one anyway. So. I, I would like to see him have almost a Joel Colborn season this year where he comes in as a player that really doesn't have a lot of NHL experience and really has a breakout season that helps define what type of player he is and who he's going to be, which I thought that Colborn had last year. Looking forward to seeing how he develops, that's for sure. Yeah. And we've also so far had uh, we, we've had a couple goals from Hoodler, which to me is not a surprise. And um, our one goal in the St. Louis game came from Glenn Cross, all guys that are expected to be scoring. Um, but one guy who's perhaps not on the board so far that people might have expected is Johnny Gaudreau. What are your thoughts on Gaudreau and how he's played so far? He's learning how to adapt to the NHL. And you can see that from how he's playing. He's a little bit more tentative than even we saw in the preseason. And not being the normal all-out dynamic offensive guy he's just taking his time learning and it is a big adjustment from the NCAA to the NHL and he didn't get any AHL time so it's a whole different ball game and 
it takes some time. And he has looked a little invisible at times. He's looked good at other times. It's all part of the developmental process. He's not going to just walk in and be a 80-point guy just because he has some flashy skill. See, and that's where I think a lot of people were perhaps expecting that based on what we saw in preseason games. And this is one of the reasons why I still think that he would benefit from a good number of games of the AHL this year is it does seem like he's still learning. It seems like he's um, adjusting the NHL game, both the size and the speed and just the uh, the quickness and thinking of the NHL game. And I would hate to see him stay here and not do as well as he could. I mean, he's projected to be on the third line for the uh, Predators game, but... I think that if he goes to the AHL, he's going to get a lot more time on the ice and a lot more chance to hone those skills. So maybe it's maybe the coaching staff needs to look at it and say, okay, he obviously needs some time there. Let's send him back and bring him back up at Christmas. Well, he hasn't really looked that out of place. Like He hasn't been the worst forward for the Flames in the three games. So I think you give him another four, five, six games probably till the end of October, and, like, if he's still struggling, like, he somewhat has been the last three, then you send him down. I don't see the point in, like, rushing to get him in the AHL right away. You know, he's a good talent, so you have to see if he can figure it out. Like, when he first got to the NCAA, he took a few games to figure out how to play in that league as well, and it seems like it every step up he goes he it takes him a couple of games and then he gets right into it again so just have to see yeah no i you you might be right i guess i was hoping that um he would have more of an impact right away based on what we saw in the preseason but yeah you're right this team's still in a learning phase and we need to give him some time to figure things out Either way, it'll become apparent if he's going to be heading back to the AHL or if he's going to stick. It's just can't flash forward two weeks to figure that out. <laughs> and I think you're right. It's the end of October, If I think, is a good deadline for that. You don't want to leave him here too long. Um, but I think if you wait till the end of October, we'll have enough games under our belt to really see how he's doing at this level. Yeah, because anybody can have a bad three-game stretch. So... <laughs> Even Hoodler and that can be off a bit, so... Yeah, that's 12 games by the end of October, and two sets of back-to-backs in there, too, which I think is also a good way of starting to look at a player and how um, much they can play in the NHL, because those back-to-backs can really kill you. Yes, and also, apparently, the Flames have been going through some problems with the flu bug, so if he's one of them then that's a little bit more of an excuse on that's why true. he might not be as optimal as <laughs> we might have hoped that's true so speaking of the flu bug um i found it interesting that the flames have been changing up their lineup quite a bit so far um in the st louis game they sat dennis weidman and um was it yeah i think it was the st louis game yeah and put rafael diaz in no, that so, was the Edmonton game. Oh, right, uh, the Hoodler game. got sat in the Blues right because he had the flu bug. So we're seeing the we're seeing the team start to um, try different guys out, and I think that's a good thing. I think guys, even somebody like Weidman, knowing that my job isn't necessarily secure every night, different guys are going to cycle in and out. I hope that gets them working at a, uh, I guess, a heavier pace, knowing that you know there's other guys out there that they will put in, and I think. Doing that in the second game of the season might send a message to the players right away, which is probably a good thing. Yeah, and they need to get better. All all the players need to get better, and competition for jobs will help to ensure that. Plus, they also have to realize that there's a whole bunch of kids on the farm that are just champing at the bit to steal their spots as well. So, they gotta put up or shut up, so to speak, and... Yeah, yeah, and, and I think even the veterans like Weidman being sat, it shows that not even the kids on the farm, but you know a, a seventh guy like Rafael Diaz um, can still be played at any time. So you, you have to play well every night or you'll be sat is kind of what that message sends to me. Yeah. Well, talking about uh, rosters, you and I a couple weeks ago made some predictions for our opening day rosters. Should we figure out how well we did? Sure. 
So we had some very similar predictions. Let's start at the back and move our way up. Um, we both had the same predictions for goaltenders, Hiller and Ramo, which is no surprise. Um, those are the two goalies that ended up getting the job, and it looks so far like they are going to get 50% of the work each, which you kind of predicted. Hiller's had two starts so far, and Ramo's expected to get the start against the Predators. So that'll be two each. So, yeah, that's kind of shaking down the way we expect it to. Um, on defense, we pretty much got the defensive core exact. Uh, we had Giordano, Brody, Smeed, Weidman, Russell, England, and Diaz or whoever the Flames signed off waivers because at the time we were talking about them making a waiver claim. And we got that exact. Um, Diaz ended up signing with the team. And so far, I think from the little bit we've seen of him, he's looking good for a guy you were paying, what, 700000 for? Yeah, no complaints for sure. No, I, I think he's... I, I'm glad that he's there and not somebody on the farm. If I look at the guys on the farm, there's nobody that I would want to sit in a seventh defensive spot and not play. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad it's him. Up front is where we had some disagreements. Um, the players that... I'll go through the list here. Um, the players that we disagreed on, we'll talk about. We both said that uh, Raymond, Monaghan, Hoodler, Backlund, Colborne, Glencross would make the team. We thought Stajan, McGratton, Bomo would make the team. We did have some other guys that we thought would or wouldn't. So I thought that Sven Berchi would make the opening day roster. I don't believe that you did. Yeah. Um, and obviously he didn't, which I was kind of surprised about. Um, I thought Michael Furland would make the opening day roster. I think you had Furland on yours too, didn't you? I believe I had both Berchi and Furland, but I can't quite recall off the top of my head at the moment. Matt would have to go back and listen to the last uh, two episodes ago. So Furland didn't make the team, which I guess I put him on there, and I think you probably did too because of the good preseason that he had. But, you know, when you look at him honestly and you look at him, you know, in the couple um, games he played during the preseason and in the AHL now, he doesn't look like he's quite ready yet. Well, that's the thing with a lot of our prospects. We're just a little bit early in their developmental process still so if they did make the opening team it would have rushed them a little bit so i can understand sending them back yeah yeah I th and i think that it's a if you look at the forwards down on the farm i mean he'll get a chance to play with guys like reinhardt granlin berchi um knight agostino I think that, that that's a good level to play at for his development. I could see if you had a really weak farm system, you might say keep him in Calgary so that he, at least he plays with some quality guys. But I think he's going to get a lot of development time while he's down there anyways. Yeah, and in the two games that he's played in the AHL, he's been with lined up with Reinhardt and Juris. So, so that's a good line. Yeah, exactly. Um Another guy that we disagreed on, I thought that Jones and Setaguchi would make the opening day roster. Um, I don't believe you had either of those guys, but they both did, and I'm not surprised. I mean, they're both one-way deals. I thought the Flames would put them on the roster for it to be their spot to lose. Mm -hmm. I know. I was hoping that they would have more of the kids up than not, but like I can understand why they kept Jones and Setaguchi, even though... They have been kind of mediocre. But we're also only three games in. True. I think it, it's early to be calling guys mediocre at this point. They might have a... I mean, look at Jerome. He always had a slow start every year when he was here. Yeah. Um, and you also thought that Bennett would be on the opening day roster. I didn't. And I guess we'll... We won't necessarily give you a point or me not a point for that because he, for, he very well could have been. He's still officially listed on the roster. But obviously he's hurt, and he'll be out for a number of months with a shoulder injury. Yeah, so come back in the new year, and we'll know then who gets the point. <laughs> exactly. He's technically on the opening day roster, so I guess you get a point for that. Um, he's not wearing the flaming C, but I don't think they can send him back to juniors when he's hurt. No, they're stuck with him up here until he gets better. So if you look at the roster on uh, calgaryflames.com, he is listed there. So I guess technically you got it right. Yeah, but, well, um, technically, Corey Potter was still on the roster as well. That's true, because he's also injured. Mm -hmm. What's uh, Potter's injury, do you know? I couldn't tell you. Seemed like he got injured very quickly after he got here. 
No, I think he was actually injured before we signed him. Oh, was he? And it just, it's taking time to heal. Okay. That would make sense, yeah, because he didn't get signed, um, he didn't get signed July 1, and I remember interviews where he said he was hurt. So, overall, we did pretty well. Um, got most of the players. It was really just the young players coming in that we didn't get right, but, I mean, really, the NHL players that are on this roster, most of these guys aren't going anywhere. The, you know, Colborn, Glenn Cross, Stajan, Jones, Setaguchi, McGratton, um, they're not going to go to the farm at all, um. But, yeah, I think we did fairly well with this one. It's interesting that the only place we deferred was in the forwards because I think that, you know, the rest of the team's pretty solid. Yeah. Well, the thing is is that I was more hopeful that we'd be having some spots in the NHL for the kids, but it's one of those things where you can understand their logic with keeping the kids down for a bit. And I yeah. think we both had Gaudreau on the farm, so like it we really, did. yeah, it really shows that, yeah, close but not quite. <laughs> yeah, well, no, that was the next thing I was going to mention. So yeah, we both had uh, Gaudreau going down to the AHL to start the year, and I know when I looked at the opening day rosters, I was quite surprised to see that he was given a, a spot on the opening day roster because I really wasn't expecting it. So we got the one kid. I'd say you know the one kid that I think deserved it the most they gave it to it's not like they said okay we have three spots for kids just shove these guys in there i think Gaudreau worked for it in the preseason as much as i think he still as we said earlier still has some training to do to get himself up to the nhl level i think he's the one guy that really deserved it coming out of camp and i'm glad they gave him the spot for it yeah and he was one of the best offensive players during the preseason so he willed himself into the nhl for sure well, that's it. And it's not like he was just the, you know, the next great guy and they had to give him a spot like yeah. a lot of teams do. He he earned that spot. I'd say if any kid earned it, it's Johnny. Yeah. And, like, that's why Sven's not up here. And, it, you know, cause I'm a, I was expecting him to make it just because of his age and his relative level of experience. But Gaudreau just was so much better that he just took the spot right off him. Yeah. So who has Sven been playing with? You've seen the first couple games in the NHL. Who's Sven been on a line with down there? I believe he's been with Knight and uh, uh, Granlund. But their other lines have been kind of shifting around a bit. So, like, I know Furland's line has been pretty much consistent, but they've been juggling the rest of them. Okay. That makes sense. And, you know, I think that, as we mentioned last week, don't look at these opening day rosters as the rosters for the season. I definitely think there's going to be a lot of movement. I think I agree with you that I'm too, it's too bad more of the kids didn't get spots, but I understand why the Flames did it, and I think that we will see um, battles coming up, maybe not this month, but as we get into November and December, I think we're going to see guys really battling for some of these last spots with injuries happening and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. It's just more impatience, the fan side of me, wanting to see the shiny new toys, so to speak, <laughs> up here instead of in upstate New York. Well, that's why you bought the uh, HL streaming package, so you can see them all. Exactly, because I figure those games are just as, if not more important than the Flames games in Calgary. So, And following up on that, um, while we're mentioning it, we talked about last week, and we had a couple people on Twitter who let us know, so thanks to those who, uh, who tweeted us. Um, the first one that I saw who tweeted us was from Josh Schroeder, who let us know that um, the AHL uses an online service called New Lion, and New Lion is their online video streaming. So if you do want to watch AHL games like Matt and I do, uh, you can go to AHL.com uh, and sign up. It's, and it's the, the, NH the, oh, the AHL. The AHL, right. Um, and then from there, you, you can you pay, I think right now there's an early bird special. It's like 99 bucks a year for just the one team. And you can watch all the games from your favorite team. So you can just subscribe to the one, or you can pay more to get the whole league. And you can watch them live, or uh, Matt told me this morning, you can watch them archived. So you can actually go back and watch old games. Yeah, so if you're watching the Flames game in Calgary, and the Adirondack Flames are playing as well, you can just watch it later, or the next day. Whatever. 
<laughs> so, so that's pretty cool. So even if you sign up later, you can go back and watch the first couple games if you want to. So if anyone's interested in following the team, uh, check out the AHL live stream uh, that's online. Excuse me, I personally just signed up for the for the Adirondack games. I don't need the whole league. Yeah, same here. I don't really care that much about how the Peoria team is doing or any of the other ones. So Matt, it's uh, not a lot of actual hockey to talk about so far, but I figured why don't we uh, do some projections into the future for the season. Um, let's talk about how we think the season is going to shake down so far. Or not so far, I guess. How the season's going to shake down in its entirety. So, what spot in the Western Conference do you think the Flames are going to finish in this year? I know we've had some crazy predictions. I think it was Aaron Ward on TSN who thought the Flames might make the playoffs. And we've had a lot of people thinking the Flames are going to be 15th in the West. Well, Aaron Ward seems to be a year early. Like, he said that Aginlo is getting traded to Boston and was the next year that he ended up going to Boston, so maybe we're making the playoffs next year. I don't see that this year, though. No, though, you know, the one thing after Aaron mentioned it, I did some research, and um, every year there seems to be a, a team at the bottom who gets on a hot run and not necessarily makes the playoffs, but ends up contending for a playoff spot. You know, they're, they're like 9, 10, 11, mm. somewhere in there. So... Maybe we don't necessarily make the playoffs, but maybe the Flames get on a hot run and put something together this season that looks like it could be a you know a decent season. Yeah, I don't see that with this roster. No, uh, I you know I'm kind I of. I think thinking, changes have to be made to the roster before that would happen. Yeah, I'm thinking more the Flames will finish either thirteenth or fourteenth in the conference. More likely fourteenth. I yeah, this team. Like, even the Edmonton game, they really should have lost that one as well. And it wasn't until the Flames scored to go up 3-2 that Edmonton just stopped playing, even though we they had us on the ropes for most of the game. When I look at the Western Conference on paper anyways, um, I think Calgary, you're right, is going to be 13 or 14. Um, I'm still debating if Calgary or Edmonton has a worse roster. I could see uh, the two of them flip-flopping at the bottom. Um, right now, Calgary's 10th and Edmonton's last, but that's not going to last long. But, I, can, I mean, if you look at the strength of teams like Minnesota, Nashville, Chicago, Anaheim, there's no way that we're going to get too high in this league. We've played too many strong Western Conference teams too many times, and I think we're, we're going to be pushed right to the bottom. So I'm predicting that we end up 13th because I'm hoping we can finish above Edmonton. I honestly don't see how Edmonton finishes that low. They have too many offensive weapons that are starting to get into the that right age group where they should be succeeding. Any team that plays good defense, though, will kick their butt. But see, I think you're right. They have a lot of good tools, but I, I just see the team falling apart. Like They have no unity, no leadership. I think it's going to fall apart on them. Yeah. I think they're better than... They were last year, but like I don't see them coming anywhere close to a playoff spot, mind you. But I think no. they're going to probably finish in that 11th overall in the West. Mm -hmm. That range, 10th or 11th, something like that. I don't see them finishing that bad. So you think Calgary finishes 13th or 14th in the West? And where do you think we sit overall then? I think we finished dead last in the West, unfortunately. And I think... Uh, Winnipeg and Nashville will be the two that we're competing with for the bottom. Um, overall, the only teams that I could see being worse than us are Carolina and Buffalo, and it'll be a dogfight. I think that those will be the three worst teams by a decent margin. Sort of like dogfight's an interesting word to use when you're talking about the teams at the bottom. Yeah. Well, who can be the biggest dog? <laughs> uh I guess I yeah the, those ones I think they'll be there'll be a separation between those three teams and like the rest of the mediocre teams sort of like Florida Buffalo and Edmonton last year how they were like 10 12 points behind everybody that kind of thing yeah when I look at the rosters on paper I don't think that you can get much worse than Buffalo this year I think that Buffalo will be below us um I think that Carolina, you could flip-flop either above us or below us. Um, I'm not really sure there. 
I can see them putting something decent together, but not enough to make the playoffs, but I can see them putting something together there. So I'm going to predict Calgary 13th in the West and in the bottom three. I don't think we'll be the bottom, but I think we'll be bottom three overall. Yeah. And realistically, it's a rebuilding process. And when you go through a teardown rebuild like we are, we're going to suck. And it's part of the process. And nobody likes the fact that we're going to be beat up quite a lot by other teams like St. Louis. But eventually we will get back into a playoff spot. It's just you have to take your beatings for a bit. Well, and this is a good draft year too. So having a you know a low finish this year could yield us yet another good crop of prospects. Yeah, and realistically, if the Flames finish anywhere in the top five picks, we're going to get a really good player. Like even uh, guys that are sixth, seventh overall they're more of like sam bennett's talent level so even if we finish a little bit better we're still gonna get a really good prospect out of it it's just you know it, we're gonna be down at the bottom it's it is and what it thing is to remember about a rebuild is really this is the goal of the franchise right now is to rebuild to restock and to find you know great young talent so if the flames end up you know, finishing that low, in a way, they've done their job. They're in a rebuild. They've said they're in a rebuild. They're trying to do this rebuild, and that's how you rebuild. As painful as it is for us as fans, we have to end up with really good draft picks because if you look at all the teams that have rebuilt lately and gone on to playoff success, that's how they get their star players. Yeah, well, look at Chicago, for example. They were bad before the lockout. They got the third overall pick which unfortunately for them was Cam Barker. Then in 06, they uh, had the third overall pick again, and they got Taze, and then a couple years later, they got Kane. So, yeah, it blows that you're going to be at the bottom, but it you look at since then, Chicago's been, like, the dominant team in the league. So... It, yes, it sucks now, but in a couple years, it'll be a good thing. It's just really Pittsburgh painful. Pittsburgh rebuilt the same way. Yeah, um, L.A. It, L.A. They are all went through periods of being really terrible at playing hockey. And it sucks, but in the long run, it's a good thing. Yeah, and it's again, it's not like we're the only ones to do this. This is the proven model. So every time the Flames lose this year, just remember that really losing a game is working towards a greater good if you will of getting the flames what they need which is a top pick in this year's draft and i know some people are concerned that like oh we're gonna turn into edmonton where we just get shiny prospects and don't know how to play hockey but if you look at how the team is playing they're instilling good habits they might not have talent but they're instilling good habits. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that to me, I think, is one of the biggest things. There's two things in my mind that separate Calgary and Edmonton. One is that, yes, we are bringing in prospects, but, I mean, A, we're not just rushing them to the team. We are putting guys in the team that deserve to be here still, just as you would if you were a competitive team, where Edmonton just seems to put young players out first and then complement them with veterans. And we're doing the opposite. We're building this roster as though it was a uh, competitive team. I mean, we could have easily said, yeah, every young guy that looks good, throw him on the opening day roster, and we didn't. And like you said, the Flames are coming up with an identity. They're deciding who they want to be. And even once these current crop of players are out of here or these current crop of players have become you know, the top guys as far as the young guys go, we're going to have an identity that is going to take the Flames far past this rebuild. And I don't see an identity for the Oilers. I see a bunch of pieces with no unity or no you know, explanation of how this team plays. Exactly. And, well, Edmonton, they seem to think that you can just outscore the opposition and win, but they don't realize that uh, 30 years have gone by since the 80s and that hockey doesn't work that way anymore. But... I mean, if you look at Edmonton, they've really been in this rebuild, I'd say this current one, for about five or six years. So it's easy to judge them now and say, um, you know, this is the problem in hindsight. And I think we have to spend some time that um, 
you know, seen where the Flames are going to be, and I have confidence they're not going to be there. But you know, we will know in in maybe three years if the Flames end up like Edmonton. But the signs so far are pointing to this team preparing things as though they were a competitive franchise. Well, if you look at uh, the only other team to get three number one overall picks in a row, the Quebec Nordiques, they got Owen Nolan, Matt Sundin, and uh, Eric Lindros. And if you flash forward five years from the point of those picks, they were they won their first cup at, with Colorado. And you look at Edmonton, and like they... I don't even see them even remotely challenging for a playoff spot, let alone becoming one. And, like, Quebec was starting to get in the playoffs at the same point past their first three number one overalls. So, it, yeah, they're a mess. (laughs) And, And at least with the Flames, they're picking players that complement the system as well. Like, uh, for me, for example, like, I didn't particularly like that Hunter Smith selection, but he does fit that hard-working, all-out type of game, and you need that. So, it's good. They're doing things the right way, so there's not as much to be concerned about of, oh, we're gonna suck in perpetuity like Edmonton. I think the other two is, even if we look past the players... The Flames have built their front office staff, their hockey ops staff, properly. I mean, we have, you know, a GM who seems like he knows what he's doing. We have Brian Burke there. We're not like the Oilers who seem like, you know, if you're once you're in the hockey ops staff, you can never be fired. It doesn't matter what you do horribly. Like, I think it's more than just... Um, it's more than just the players on the ice. And that's where I think the Flames are excelling as well and putting the entire hockey operations side the way it needs to be in order for this team to be ready for success and to have success in the rebuild. Exactly. And it starts from the top down. And if you have good people in charge, then that will trickle down to the team. And Edmonton doesn't seem to have that. And it's like I'm actually getting to the point of feeling sorry for Edmonton's fans because who needs to watch that, you know? Just you really know, bad. <laughs> And as much as the Flames have been bad for a number of years, they've never, I mean, you know, even in the mid-90s during the Young Gun era, as much as people said this team was bad, the team was never in the bottom three. So, you know, this we've always had kind of a mediocre team. So I think this is new to Calgary fans of the rebuild. They've never really rebuilt before. I think that's why a lot of people are still not sure how to handle this. Yeah, I can agree with that. You know, people always say how bad those teams were, but if you look in the standings, those teams did okay. They didn't make the playoffs, but they were never picking, you know, top five, top four, that that kind of thing. So it's they they must have been decent teams. Well, it, when the Flames were going through their rebuild in the late '90s, like they still had guys like Flurry, Valerie Bure, Aginla, Savard. So like they weren't completely without talent. They, they just didn't. They were more like the Winnipeg Jets are now, where they have some good pieces, but not enough to get but to I'd, the But I'd argue that's how the current Flames are, too. I mean, if you look around the roster, we have some good pieces. We've got guys like Hoodler and that sort of thing. I, I think that there's definitely some talent here, but we've now admitted that we're rebuilding, and we're going through the process that that requires. I think in the mid-'90s, if they would have said they're rebuilding – nobody would have come back like that's when they were trying to sell tickets and having a hard time and i don't think the fans would have bought tickets and the team still wouldn't be in calgary if they would have admitted that true so yeah i think anyone that's uh worried about us becoming edmonton i think there's a lot of good things going for for the flames right now Mm -hmm. just gotta be patient (laughs) slow and steady wins the race in a rebuild exactly Looking at the Adirondack roster, I don't know if you have had a lot of time to look at the other HL rosters, but do you think that the Adirondack Flames uh, are good enough to win a Calder Cup this year? Probably not, but they should be a, a playoff team there. The Flames have a lot of good forward prospects and some solid defense prospects, but usually the teams that vie for the Calder Cup have a more veteran laden roster and we don't so it depends they should be good to probably win their division assuming Ordeo snaps out of his 
playing terribly <laughs> mode, but we'll see. I, I don't... Yeah, I'm not sure if they're going to win the Calder Cup. I think this team is built to go f- into the playoffs for sure. Um, I think that they can go further than the first round like they did last year. Um, I think part of the problem last year was the team got decimated by call-ups to Calgary. Um, but I don't... I, you're right. Generally, the teams that win the Calder Cup have more veteran presence. Now, that could change if some of our veterans get sent down. We might have the presence that we need. But as of the opening day rosters for Adirondack, I think this team will go deep. But I don't think they're going to win the Calder Cup, at least on paper right now. Yeah, anything can happen. It's just one of those things. <laughs> and creating that winning environment. And some teams don't care, but I still believe that creating the winning environment in the AHL and ECHL is the right thing to do. You want to promote playoffs to your farm team. Well, especially like if they can, the kids like Ryan Hart and Fairland and all that, they can learn how to win with each other. Then as they transition up into the NHL roster, they'll know what it is to win. And with these guys, and you want to get a group together that will fight for each other. Yeah. And moving forward, and instead of just pieces like Edmonton. And well, and that, a group that gets to know each other over time as well. Yeah, and you want that camaraderie to emerge so that way when they do come up to Calgary, they have that bonding together and hopefully one day win a Stanley Cup. So it's just you got to start getting all the right habits in place and that just takes time and putting the system in. Yeah, well, I think that's the biggest thing about this year on both the AHL and the NHL sides. It's a year to learn the system. It's a year to get both sides synced up in the same system. And if they can do that successfully and have the AHL and the NHL guys kind of all synced up in the same system, I think the year is a success overall. Can't argue with that. Um, last question as we kind of look at how the season shakes down. How many players do you think we're going to see wearing the Flaming C this year? I would put the over on 40, actually. I think we'll see quite a lot of roster turnover. I'll also, I wouldn't be surprised if a whole host of the forward group in the AHL gets called up as well as the defensemen. Just, especially down the road, like I'm not saying like, oh, by November they're going to have eight or nine guys up here, but more towards after the trade deadline when we've seen guys like Augustino, Knight, and all those guys come up. Yeah, so they started with a 23-man roster. You're thinking upwards of 40. So you're thinking at least 17 call-up guys will probably wear a Flames jersey this year. I could see guys like even like Akalatsi and Kulak, Poirier, a whole bunch of guys get a game here or two just to A, reward them for good efforts, potential good efforts in the farm and to see what they got for sure i think myself i've been thinking about this all week i think we're going to see five or six players come to this team via trade uh who will be wearing a flames jersey that aren't right now i think throughout the year they're going to bring in some players via trade and i think we're going to see several pieces come back to us at once at least in one trade um I'm thinking something like a Glenn Cross trade. We might see like a pick and some prospects or a pick and some young players. But I agree with you. I think there will be a ton of uh, of farm team guys, not including all the guys that might come up because I didn't even think about that after the deadline where the upper limit of the roster doesn't uh, matter. There is no upper limit. I'm thinking that we're going to see 12 call-up players. So I'm about where you are, 12 and 5. Um, I think we're going to see 12 call-up players throughout the season be brought into this team. They might not play more than one game, but I think we'll see 12 oh, no. guys like brought I, up from the farm. I'd be shocked if more than like four or five guys even played five games, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. Like, I don't see that. I just see a lot of rotation of, oh, you've been doing good here. Here's your reward for your hard work. Have a few games up here, that kind of thing. Well, and I think, too, that this year, because the Flames have a more diverse group on the farm, I think that we're going to see different guys brought up based on who gets hurt. And in the past, it always seemed like there was one, two, maybe three guys they always went to, and there's an injury. But I think we're going to see injured players get matched by a similar AHL player. So I think there will be more guys because of that. 
Yeah, it's not like in 0304 where if somebody got hurt, oh, Jason Morgan, step on down. <laughs> well, even even the last couple of years, I mean, they always seem to go with the same guys. You know, they had the the street. Uh, they had you know Ben Street. They had um, Paul Byron. They had a couple guys they always went to, and that's good to have. But I think in where we are, um, they they need to call up the right guy. And I wouldn't even be surprised. Okay, so. You know, Bowley gets hurt. All right, David Jones, you step in because you're the next guy in line in kind of the truculence department. David Wolf, not Jones. David Wolf. Sorry, David Wolf. Yeah, you step in because you're next in the truculence department, but you're only going to play here for a game or two because that's all we want to see, and we're sending you back down. And if say Lentz or if Paul Byron got hurt, he wouldn't be the first guy up. It'd be somebody different. So I wouldn't be surprised if every player on the roster has almost been matched up with someone on the farm. That if this guy goes down, here's who comes up. I can agree with that. That's how I'd probably be doing it. Yeah, with some exceptions. Like, if somebody is just blowing it away down there, then they get yeah, the call up regardless. Yeah, but, but those become kind of your defaults. Yeah. Um, and as I look at both rosters, I have them side by side right now. Um, I'm seeing a lot of similarities between the two. And different players, I'd say, yeah, this guy could probably fill, you know, this other guy's hole or whatever. Mm-hmm. So I think this year, because this team is not going to be the most interesting to watch on the ice, um, there's a lot of interesting storylines surrounding this team. A lot of kind of subplots within the Flames. And I thought we'd point out some here. And uh, if there's any you want to add to this list, go ahead. But let's debate a couple of these and see what we think or what we think the answers will be. I think one of the interesting storylines to follow is going to be how long does Gaudreau stay in Calgary? We've already talked a little bit about that, but I don't see him playing... 70 games of flame this year for me it's too early to tell i think if he rebounds in the next even two or three games because the play, flames play three and four nights this week if he rebounds during those games and actually looks better more like his preseason form then i could see him sticking for most of the year if not then i could see him getting half a year or so in the AHL or maybe even the full year. Yeah. So that'll be an interesting story to follow. I know that's one of the things I'm interested in seeing. And I don't want people to think I'm anti Gaudreau. I'm not. I think Gaudreau is a great player. I think he's, you know, a good prospect for this team. I just don't want them to rush him. So, you know, I don't want it to sound like I'm anti Gaudreau. I just don't know that his time is now. Yeah. You have to do what's best for the player. And in a situation like this, is Gaudreau's best spot up here? If it is, then great, keep him up here. Yeah, if we don't not, need to appease the fans and sell tickets by keeping him up here. We've already sold all the tickets, so now we got to look at the player. Exactly. And if he's better suited to be down in the AHL for half the year, send him down. If not, keep him up. But it has to be what's best for the player in that particular person's development not oh we need to sell some tickets yeah and in some markets they have to do that and you know as much as you might not like it that's kind of what they have to do but here we don't have to do that so i think we have a great luxury there and we can do exactly what's right for the players not necessarily what we need to do to get people in the door no and a lot of fans realize that we're kind of kind of suck either way and while it would be a lot nicer to have the Gaudreaux and the Bear Cheese up here just for something to watch, it they also realize that long-term it's better for whatever they need. If you want to watch them, buy the AHL package. Exactly. And the, the AHL games actually haven't been that bad. Like The last two games they did lose quite handily. But if you actually watch the games, they were actually quite close and entertaining. So definitely, if you're wanting to watch some good Flames hockey this year, get the AHL package. And the level of compete isn't that much different than the AHL. A lot of people think, oh, it's the AHL. It's going to be a totally different level. These are guys that are, for the most part, ready to become NHLers or have been NHLers. So the, the game isn't that much different in its speed and quickness than the NHL. No, you just see a few more mistakes than you normally would. That's yeah. all. So, speaking of Gaudreau, let's talk about Gaudreau's uh, sidekick, J Bill Arnold. Bill Arnold is now playing in Adirondack uh, for the Baby Flames. And we've never really seen Bill Arnold 
in his pro time, I guess, playing without Goudreau. Uh, who's he been playing with down there for the last couple games? I think he's been on the, the fourth line uh, with Van Braidbant and Tusignant. Okay. He hasn't so, been bad. So for me, one of the things that will be interesting is to see how he does without Goudreau. Maybe he can become a different type of player if they're putting him on the fourth line. Maybe they're trying to get him to be more of a, you know, a truculent player than a playmaker. And maybe Arnold just has a bad year because he needs some time to adjust to not having Goudreau there. So if you are watching the AHL stuff, I think that's going to be a really interesting story to follow Actually, there. my mistake, he's been playing with Augustino. Actually, he made a nice pass uh, to Augustino in the first game, and Augustino made it, scored a nice goal in that game. Well, that's what he's good at. He's, he's a setup man. Yeah, he made a nice cross-ice pass to him. So... My so mistake, Augustino, he's not playing on the fourth line. He's playing with Augustino. Maybe Augustino can take over as kind of his, you know, sniper there to set up. But maybe Arnold will have a, a bad year. We'll see. I think, to me, that's going to be an interesting story to follow out of Adirondack. Yeah. And he's looked all right. No different than any of the other guys down there. So. Yeah. But he also came as part of a package. It's like, you know, one city in without the other. These guys came as part of a package, and I'll think it'll be interesting to see what happens when we split those two up. Did you really compare two of our guys to the Sedins? Yes. <laughs> Boo! <laughs> well, that that would be something that I'd be interested in seeing at some point, too. If Vancouver trades one of them, how they do without each other. True. Um, Still, boo. <laughs> all right, you can boo me on that one. Um, the next storyline that I had down here that I think will be interesting for fans to follow is if Sven will actually make it to Calgary this year. As we talked about earlier, if Sven doesn't make a, a good shot at this team this year, if he gets you know a couple games after the deadline or whatever, but it's not really that he's earned a spot before the deadline, I think that his time as a flame might be over. Um, I think he might have ex- overstayed his welcome and they might just move on to someone else because they've got a good farm team there. So... I'm curious to see if he's going to make the Flames this year. Do you think he'll be wearing a Flaming C before the deadline? Honestly, if he continues how he's played the couple of games in the AHL, if he keeps that up, I don't see him even being down there by Christmas. Well, he's got something to prove. I mean, we know that he was upset when he got sent down last year. His father's been upset this year, talking to papers back in Switzerland. So we know that this kid feels like he's got something to prove, and that's probably the biggest motivation he needs. Yeah, and he has been creating some opportunities down there. Didn't capitalize on any of them, but he's been probably the most dangerous forward down there. So we'll see how he progresses and if he does turn it around or not. It is one of those things that is interesting to follow. Yeah, we'll see. I I agree with you. I think he'll be back here by Christmas, but I think if he's not... Um, oh yeah, well then that's a major this could red have repercussions flag. For yeah. His, yeah, this could have repercussions for the rest of his career. Yeah, definitely. And that would be one of those situations where then you probably look to another team like, say, Buffalo, who has 10 tons of defensemen, and see if you can't make a prospect for prospect trade then. Yeah, or bundle them as part of uh, another package. You exactly. Know what might do. Whatever permutation comes out. It depends, but it's up to him, really. Yeah, I think Sven needs more than just an injury call-up. I think he needs to make this team um, and stay with them for a significant amount of time for him to, I guess, have a successful season, if you will. And I think he can do it. I think he's one of the few guys down there that could earn a full-time spot that doesn't have one already. Mm Mm-hmm. And he's a good player. He just needs to put the little touches on his game that... He's a little bit below NHL caliber on. That's all. And, you know, the best thing coaches can do is know how to motivate each individual player on their roster. Different guys need to be motivated in different ways. Maybe this is Hartley's way of trying to motivate him. Maybe he knew that last year he really didn't get motivated until he got sent to the A. So, you know, this could all be part of Hartley's master plan. Yes, and sometimes you need to get punched, so to speak, in order to respond. And maybe this is... Sven getting punched, so hopefully he responds. Yeah. So we'll see, but I think he's got a good shot of making the team this year. Oh, yeah. I definitely could see him making the team in the not-too-distant future. And the last thing on our storylines to watch this year 
is will Sam Bennett actually wear a flaming C? Do you think he'll come back from his injury and wear a flaming C for the team for more than, let's say, you know, two or three games? Do you think he earns a spot on this team, or do you think he comes back and they either send him back to junior or to the AHL to rehab his shoulder? Well, I could see them sending him to the AHL for the injury Can rehab. Can you go down there, though? Because he's yes. 18. I don't... Yes. Because yeah. of an injury, he's allowed to go so down. down. A conditioning stint? Yes, and okay. it, there, there's X number of days that he can be down there. I don't know the exact, but he, he can. And if that's the case, then I could see him. If he does well in the A, then he'll probably get a few games up here. If he's just okay, then I think he gets sent to Kingston. I'm not holding my breath at this point that he no. wears a flaming C for a significant amount of time this year, more than, say, one or two games. I don't even think he gets his nine-game tryout. No. I mean, by the time he's healthy and ready to go, um, I think that it would probably not be in our best interest to push him into NHL-level competition this year. No. Well, if you go by the four- to six-month timeline, like, you're talking mid-January to mid-March, like, there's not really that much time left in the year so it might be better for him to go back to Kingston and get a playoff run in at least just to get back into skating a bit yeah yeah I think you're right so again another thing to watch there um any other storylines you think fans will want to be watching this year any more subplots you think are interesting will Edmonton figure out how to play defense <laughs> Um, yeah, I guess. I mean, there's a lot of questions with other teams, but yeah, I guess that's the age-old question, right? Does Edmonton realize that there's players on the blue line who aren't forwards? They're not a second set of wingers. Yeah. Well, that's something to amuse us, at least. You know, if we're going to have a bad year, might as well be able to poke fun at our rivals up north. For sure. We're, we always have time for that, don't we, Matt? It's always good to make fun of Edmonton. Um, thought we'd take a look at a couple of the young flames in the system here who are doing some good stuff so far. We did this a couple years ago, or a couple weeks ago, and looked at some of the uh, players in the system and what they were doing. Um, again, some surprising results here as far as I'm looking at it. Uh, Austin Carroll, who was our seventh-round pick in the past draft, is on a seven-game point streak. He's playing for the Victoria Royals in the WHL. He has seven games played, and he's got ten points so far with a minus one. So he's six goals, four assists. And again, I'm surprised that a guy like this, who is a seventh-round pick, is on better than a point-per-game production right now in the WHL. Well, you have to keep in mind that he is an overage player, and he's 20 years old, so it would be somewhat disappointing if he wasn't putting up at least a point per game. Usually, if a player is going to have any NHL potential at all, they at the age of 20 in juniors they need to be at least one of the top guys in scoring in the league so it's good it, i wouldn't be wowed by oh he has 10 points in seven games but it's a good first step well i guess the reason i'm wowed by that is if you look at his pace so far in 2012 2013 he had 42 points in 67 games and if you look at last year 2013 2014 he had 57 points in 70 games so based on the current numbers, he's on par to do a massive season for points. Yeah, uh, like I'm not saying it's bad. It's just it shouldn't be completely unexpected, that's all. Yeah. Um, another guy who's doing well so far is Hunter Smith, uh, who we mentioned earlier, This sec one of our second-round picks. Actually, our only second-round pick this year. No, he's we had two. Oh, right, Mason, yeah. Mason McDonald, yeah. Um, he's playing for the Oshawa Generals, and again, he's on uh, a point-per-game production. He has three game, three goals, four assists for seven points in seven games. So any time a player can do at least point-per-game in the CHL, I'm pretty happy with what they're doing so far. Yeah, and I would be disappointed if he wasn't hitting a point-per-game. Usually, if you're not at that point, then... Your NHL potential is somewhat questionable, unless you're a defenseman, of course, but that's a whole different kettle of fish. But it, usually for a player to transition upwards, they need to show that they can at least put the puck in the net at that level. It 
stats don't really matter, but usually there's a threshold that you you need to at least be above this line type of thing. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, you're right in a lot of ways. I guess it's it's good to see that some of these guys who weren't necessarily first-round picks are doing really well because we always focus on the first-round guys. So to see guys in the seventh round and the second round, you know, in other rounds doing well is – Oh yeah, it's good hope for the future. Yeah, don't get me wrong; they're progressing at, in a good manner. It's just don't be getting like, oh wow, he's a point per game guy at the OHL level, so he'll transition and become a scorer in the NHL. It doesn't necessarily work that way. Well, but... remember he's o- he's over point per game with seven games played so far too. I mean, if we have this discussion in March and. He, and he's still doing the same, then maybe there's something to be said. But seven games in, that's not all that... I mean, I, I don't want to say it's not all that impressive a feat, but like you said, for an overager who has good stats in the past couple of years, it's not unexpected that he'd be at that point this year. Yeah. Well, like, if you look in the AHL, Paul Thompson uh, for Albany scored four goals against the Baby Flames, and he only had, like, six goals last year, so... <laughs> He's almost at a season high right there. Yeah, pretty much. Well, I think that was like uh, McGratton a couple years ago. He scored, like, I think his third or fourth goal of the year, and he beat his season high for us. Where if a lot of players say, hey, I got my fourth goal, nobody would really care. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, um, okay. <laughs> yeah, 2012-2013, McGratton had three goals, and last year he had four goals. So last year he beat his season high. So... Maybe there's another storyline we can look at. Is Ken McGratton get more than four goals this year? Can he get five? Put can Gaudreau on his line and just tell him to stand in front of the net and Gaudreau will find him. Can he get better? But even if Gaudreau finds him, he's got to put it in then. Well, he had that one really nice goal in Sylvan Lake in the preseason. So His best uh, career best so far is eight points on a year, which was last year, four goals, four assists. So let's see if he can do better than that. Yeah. We want double digit scrats. Come on. There you go. At least goes to ten. It's two more points. So there's another storyline we can watch. We can turn now that we got Bow League as the enforcer, maybe we can turn McGratton into a scorer. Sure. Why not, right? Yep. It'll be fun to watch. Anything else you want to chat about this week, Matt? No, I'm good. Just looking forward to some good flames hockey this week. We're playing four times between They're on uh, a big road swing right now. Yeah. The, so, what six six games on the road? Yeah, I think um, it's our season high long road trip right now. So we had Edmonton and St. Louis already. Tuesday we take on the Predators, and Wednesday we take on Chicago. Friday we've got the Blue Jackets, and Sunday we got the Jets. So we got what one, two, three, four games in seven days. Yeah, and then uh, we come home for five, so that'll be fun. That's actually quite an interesting... S- and then we're on the road again for 1, 2, 3, 4, yeah. 5. Yeah, it's so really weird. They keep doing that stands. all year. It's like long road trip, long homestand, and so on. I guess they're trying to uh, save on the miles traveled. <laughs> Could be. Yeah, I'd be curious to compare that with arena bookings and see you know, maybe what's being booked at different arenas at different times. But... At least for the first couple months, it's nice to have these home stands and then road stands. Yeah. And, well, I, and well, it, it's really going to make teams, if everyone schedules like that, it's going to make teams be better on the road. Yeah, because you get used to the adversity of being in a hostile place. Yeah. So we'll see. But, yeah, this week a lot of Flames hockey to enjoy. And uh, four games before we talk next. Yeah, and there's three AHL games if you're watching those as well. So. so seven possible games for Flames fans to watch that have to do with the Flames this year. Yeah. In the next week. So lots of hockey. Yeah. Um, It'll be fun. And, you know, if we look at the teams that we're against, too, this is not just a long road stand. It's going to be a tough road stand. Like taking on the Predators, the Blackhawks, um, and the Blue Jackets, those are going to be some tough games. Yeah. How many of the four do you think the Flames win? I think the Flames will beat Winnipeg on Sunday. I think the Flames can beat the Blue Jackets if they go to overtime or a shootout. Um, I don't think that we're going to beat the Preds or um, the Blackhawks. So I think we're going to do 500 hockey and win two of them. Yeah. I think we're the, the only game I see us winning is Winnipeg. 
but who knows? Maybe Chicago has an off night and we we beat them. So didn't who, we beat them quite handily last year at one point? Yeah, I think we won like five four or something like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. So we'll we'll see, and uh, you know maybe these road games are what guys like Johnny Hockey need to really you know jump into the NHL and be in the hostile environment before coming home to a big uh, crowd reception. Well, plus with uh, the road, you don't get last change. So Gaudreau needs to learn how to face other teams' best players because they're obviously going to put the their best guys. They're not going to be putting the third-line D-men out there. They're going to be usually putting their top guys, so he needs to learn how to adapt to that as well. All part of the learning curve in the NHL, things that... We don't often see because generally guys that come up have more experience. But, yeah, it'll be interesting to see that progression this year in his game. Yeah, it's like watching a tree grow. <laughs> but more interesting than watching a tree grow. Depends on how much of a tree enthusiast you are. <laughs> That's true. I've, ne- I've never seen play-by-play play for a tree growing either. <laughs> oh, man, that would be I would really love to boring. See, I would love to see somebody try and call tree growing. <laughs> Oh, I think that's a new leaf. <laughs> that's right. There's a new leaf. There's a new leaf growing. You got to get really excited about it, just like our, our NHL announcers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, Matt, I'll let you go of your Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah. Take Have it easy, night, everyone. And we'll, see, and we'll talk to you next week. Yeah. Take it easy. Fireside Chat is produced and edited by Dan Stevenson. This show is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca.